this is class what, 12 this is class 12 right am I correct in assuming that this is class 12 I don't think so I don't think it's 11 I think it's 12 can you can you double check everyone uh, yeah it is 12 years let me record the class so we're going to write Dr. Sam and class 12 and we are on our way and the class is being recorded okay so what is it that we're having today we're having uh, chapter 7 Brian Friel dancing at Lunas so this is the last leg on this very long journey that we had together uh, I'm hopeful yeah I mean the journey was tiring and sometimes uh, exhausting lots of material in so limited so limited um, you know a space in terms of time but you you guys did uh, an excellent job in terms of preparing and discussing stuff in class and everything so dancing at Leonasa uh, happens to be our the final leg on this uh, long journey um, Sarah is saying that she enjoyed the class or the classes you guys were great I mean had it not been for the um, your in interactive nature the fact that you interacted and you you informed the discussions by whatever insights you came out with so I thank you for for this lively class or this lively course I mean you were very engaged and at the same time engaging um, I'm hopeful that uh, you can sus sustain this interest in literature that you have shown. <coughs> uh, Rama is saying me too. Also, thank you, doctor. You're most welcome, Rama. Um, like I said, uh, today, not today. Uh, actually, today marks the beginning, not the end of the class. And uh, this marks the end uh, of the the Lyonisa journey that we are starting um, and uh, perhaps next time or the time after will be um, the end uh, of it all uh, thank you Sarah okay so dancing at Lyonasa and by the way Lyonasa is obviously an Irish name and uh, this is part of the Irish culture they have their own names and they don't seem to kind of uh, correspond to the way we say things whether in English or any in any other European uh, language they have their own language where there is uh, perhaps a tendency to drop things to say some some something in an extreme way uh, excuse my Irish pronunciation if you like <laughs> anyway so it's dancing at Leonaza and Leonaza is obviously a place uh, or a festival in Ireland <coughs> um, and it's dancing and dancing is going to be very significant in in the play it's a play not a short story we're done with uh, Jim Joyce and his uh, Dubliners and we spoke uh, long about what he means uh, and how he delivers what what he means uh, and how unique he is in terms of style and terms of language uh, and we spoke about him as the most intentional of writers you can't just read whatever he says uh, um, and you ca kind of pass it off just like this you you, you need to think and perhaps uh, think twice about what he says because he means uh, what he uh, says spoke about the Irish background and the fact that Ireland for uh, a substantial part of its history uh, was under uh, British occupation and they have expressed that in their work and uh, out of this uh, again out of this occupation you have those local tensions 
between the people of Ireland themselves and the uh, unionists who believe that they should be part of England and uh, Britain and those uh, nationalists uh, who think that they should um, kind of uh, become independent uh, of and from England. And they don't believe that they are part of England and it has always been time for them to kind of separate themselves then divorce themselves from mainstream England. Whether they were successful or not, uh, that would be another issue. And how they got there, how how um, finally and at last um, Ireland became independent and a republic in its own right. Uh, it took, of course, tensions, it took violence, uh, it took a lot of turmoil within the Irish land itself, between even uh, the people inside. So, um, dancing at Leonaza is going to be a variation on those tensions. It's Irish and it is Irish to the core. Uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of characters, in terms of the, the atmosphere that uh, per pervades the, um, the play. And you can, by now you can even, uh, you can smell it, you know what uh, Irish literature and what Irish language and what Irish um, you know characters are all about. You can almost tell um, now Irish literature from mainstream English uh, literature. Okay, so we're talking about uh, Brian Friel. Uh, Brian Friel is an Irish uh, playwright and poet and uh, novelist and um, you know he's part of this uh, uh, you know um, you know, groups of, of artists who are uh, engaged with the the Irish cause and he talks about it but he has his own way of doing it so, I mean his way is more or less reconciliatory he is uh, not for confrontations and he believes that uh, com uh, he's you know more or less like James Joyce he believes that confrontation uh, does not really uh, bear fruit it does not really uh, make uh, um, achievements um, it's all about uh, you know people um, you know confronting each other and um, you know sharing and exchanging hatred uh, and eventually nothing happens nothing positive comes out of it uh, he, he is one of those who um, believe that there should be a third way. Uh, it shouldn't be too um, too much appeasement uh, and too much appeasing uh, of and with the um, occupier, and it shouldn't also too uh, shouldn't be too um, um, radical, um, too violent. That he believes that literature can play um, a reconciliatory role. You can always achieve things uh, out of you know um, you know projecting whatever ideas you have in a peaceful way and this is what we're going to see in a minute so it's uh, chapter seven um, uh, Brian Friel dancing at UNASA um, again I'm stressing the fact that uh, the word uh, this is typical uh, whenever we have a title we sometimes need to kind of uh, try to unpack the title before we get started I think I need to close the window because it's open and obviously there is noise outside. Just give me a second. Yes. <coughs> okay, so hopefully no noise anymore. Again. So we're unpacking the title, uh, Dancing and Leonasa. So dancing is something that you normally um, have in, in atmospheres and in environments where uh, there is uh, harvesting and there is um, rituals and mythology 
and we have all of that in uh, in Ireland okay and then Lunessa Lunessa is more or less like a festival that they have and it's a dancing festival where they mark um, the harvest the uh, um, the reaping of uh, of uh, crops and uh, and other uh, greenery uh, greeneries uh, okay so we're talking about what this is uh, a typical uh, perhaps village um, atmosphere where uh, people are um, you know people st stick to their traditions when it comes to time of harvest, uh, harvesting they mark that by dancing by uh, going out and um, you know enjoying the moment and marking it um, again uh, I'm also stressing the fact that there is a, a harvest um, festival because this something belongs to the past and we have a number of characters and we're going to check the reaction to this kind of dancing and this kind of um, f festivities and some of them are going to say no uh, this is a single uh, a thing of the past and we shouldn't be going uh, um, to the past all the time we need to look forward so you will have this point of tension between the those who advocate going back to the past and those who advocate moving forward and i think this is a recurrent theme this is something that we have seen even in joyce and his short stories if you still remember okay so let's talk about uh, freel and let's talk about his biography who, who is freel who is brian freel um, so as you can see he was born in ireland in Northern Ireland to be more specific uh, in 1929 his father was a teacher and his father wanted him to be a teacher too uh, at one point he would think of becoming a priest he himself uh, entertained the thought of becoming a priest but at one point he would change his mind and enroll himself in um, St. Joseph's uh, training college in Belfast in order to become uh, uh, it's a teacher training and institute and he wanted to become a teacher and he uh, and a teacher he became uh, at one point um, so uh, it took him like a decade uh, 10 years to work as a teacher from between 1950 and 1960 uh, he worked uh, at, as a teacher and uh, on on the margin of uh, this career or um, working as a teacher he would write short stories and he would publish them uh, at one point he would uh, think that it would be, be better for him and perhaps for the students to stop teaching and focus on his literary career which which he did at one point so Friel uh, quit teaching in 1960 to become a full-time uh, writer of short stories uh, radio plays and stage plays he dedicated himself um, to um, writing as of 1960 uh, in 1980 he would uh, uh, found or establish uh, a, a theater that would be later uh, on uh, be known as uh, field day it's um, uh, uh, he did it uh, along with and with the help and collaboration of uh, an actor by the name of um, an actor and a director by the name of Stephen Rea and they produced works of social and political uh, significance I mean it was uh, they were they had messages whether those messages were social or political and they were trying to get them across to people they would uh, even get their uh, plays and they move around in the different towns and villages to uh, kind of uh, perform um, and out of uh, these performances people get uh, messages whether those messages were social or political um, if we talk about his major works 
uh, we will have Philadelphia here I come crystal and Fox the freedom of the city volunteers translations dancing at Lunasa and Molly Sweeney Molly Sweeney happens to be uh, his last um, again um, there has to be a bit of background um, historical historical background so that you can set the play in its right perspective um, and the history that we should be addressing has to do with this um, Anglo-Irish you know conflict ever since the the British came in the uh, 17th century um, you know life in England changed beyond recognition uh, I told you at one point that the English uh, typical of any occupiers were trying to obliterate the identity uh, of Ireland they wanted people to um, kind to forget totally that they are Irish and uh, if they the if they want history if they want culture it would be the mainstream culture the the English culture um, uh, they uh, uh, obviously succeeded in that uh, they succeeded in uh, making people forget that they, they they have their own history and their own culture and even their own language the language that was uh, spoken right after uh, and during the uh, uh, occupation was uh, all English to the extent that even uh, big names that we now identify as English writers are not English actually they they were Irish but they were uh, writing in English and they were so assimilated to the English culture that you would take them as English writers when uh, in actual fact they were Irish when you think of uh, people like Johnson jo Jonathan Swift for example when you think of people like uh, Bernard Shaw uh, remember when you sp uh, no this this was Scottish not Irish um, again um, what I'm stressing was the fact that uh, in this fight for culture in this fight for uh, identity the English um, won so m many battles and they could uh, uh, cultural ba battles I mean and they they could at one point obliterate the identity of the Irish and um, when they present uh, the Irish character in their plays and in their work um, they would uh, represent them and present them as uh, you know dull figures as stupid figures as um, people belong to the countryside who are um, perhaps gullible who are um, stupid who are taken to drinking um, and uh, a bit impulsive and violent these were the images that they projected and when they projected for so long even uh, Irish people started to internalize these figures and these uh, impressions about their character and they started to perhaps behave within uh, these molds or those molds that the, uh, the English uh, succeeded in, in, in building for them so with the collapse of the Gaelic social and political order Gaelic means Irish at the beginning of the 17th century the cultural traditions of Ireland were abandoned so they the English succeeded in ha in replacing the culture uh, of Ireland with, with theirs with the English culture and that that stayed and continued until the perhaps late 19th century when a group of Irish writers um, I mean they uh, kind of put their heads together and said no this is uh, this is not reality we have a culture of our own we have we used to have a language and we used to have history um, we need to kind of go 
uh, all the way back to our history and perha perhaps revive it get inspiration from it and that would uh, bring um, about our independence uh, individual uh, I mean eventually uh, this can be a good uh, this can be a fuel for uh, us uh, and it can kind of push us forward in our um, war of independence if you like so uh, on this um, until the, the the end of the 19th century the only uh, context with the ancient civilization um, of Ireland of course available were relatively uh, inaccessible in, inaccessible relics in the folklore of the countryside and manuscript rooms of the and the manuscript rooms of the museums and academies this was only this was the only link to the past it's something that you find stored in museums and nobody is um, normally has access to them again this is all uh, this was all designed and meant by the British they wanted to obliterate the identity of uh, the Irish altogether <coughs> uh, again I spoke uh, about the idea that um, when you check the literary and the cultural history of England you're going to find that um, lots of the I, I mean the English names that we with we thought um, uh, are English uh, are not neg English they were Irish uh, but they uh, they somehow uh, assimilated and absorbed the English culture and they um, they w came out as English people took them for ang English writers so it's not surprising that although many of the most distinguished dramatists were writing in English between 1700 and 1900 were born in Ireland their works were written according to the idiom and conventions of the English stage and they even uh, were referred to, to as English uh, writers again uh, when you talk about this um, you know this part of history between 17 in the 17th and the 19th century you have the the Irish stock characters okay they were presenting um, Irish people um, I mean they gave them stock character stock characters and uh, means that you whenever you have a work of art you can expect um, to have a rule an Irish rule and this Irish rule is uh, normally limited to the figure of um, the humorous character um, either a gentleman or a peasant whose distinctive features were his out see outrageous dialect he speaks in a dialect that nobody understands uh, proclivity to Irish bulls uh, he is uh, he has blunders in his speech he doesn't say things in in a straightforward manner and uh, pugnacious disposable pugnacious means that he is given uh, to violence and he gets irritated and he gets uh, violent uh, easily so it was a caricature um, any kind of uh, character that was pr presented so whether you're a soldier or, y or you're a priest or a gentleman or a fortune hunter or a servant you have all these um, characteristics uh, and features again like I said this has to come to an end uh, in the late 19th century and it did come to an end with the, the appearance of a group of Irish writers they were nationalists for the most part and they said no this is not the literature that has been produced about Ireland and on Ireland does not really reflect the Irish reality or we're not uh, we don't speak um, um, an accent or a dialect that is not understood 
we're not stupid we're not caricatured like we have we're human beings and whatever applies to normal human beings apply to us uh, so um, they started what we call what we now know as the Irish literary renaissance it was a renaissance uh, where they started to um, produce, um, you know, literary works, whether these works were plays or poetry or even novels, in which they um, try to kind of um, 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 you know, purify literature from those cliches and from those stock characters and from those st stereotypical uh, ideas they would write uh, things depending uh, and going back to their uh, old mythology Irish mythology and their history uh, in order to kind of give hope to people normally if if you don't know your history if you don't know your culture culture it's it's easy for other people to come up and claim you as uh, perhaps theirs they would even you would be a, an easy victim to 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 them or an easy target because you you don't have a history to rely back on so again those people the people of the literary uh, renaissance the irish literary renaissance came and started themes that are irish they started techniques that are irish uh, they started ideas that are rooted in uh, an Irish history and I Irish culture so that uh, people can restore their confidence and their faith in their history and their identity and that would be uh, you know uh, perhaps a first step towards uh, achieving independence eventually so the father of this movement was the poet William Butler Yeats w William Butler Yeats uh, along with uh, a dramatist by the name of Lady Gregory started this Irish literary renaissance and they even um, uh, started a theater and they called it uh, the uh, Abbey Theater Abbey Theater um, was kind of a symbol of, uh, of their efforts so Yeats founded the Irish Literary Theatre in 1899, which became the show uh, piece of the National Literary Movement, uh, and they used to call it Dublin Abbey Theatre. Again, the idea would be to replace the caricature of Irish life on stage with serious and authentic drama which would be popular yet not ruled by political orthodoxies and they committed themselves to the experimentation with an imaginative and poetic drama that would harness the heroic legend to the demands of the modern stage so again you are going back to your history um, and to your culture your old culture uh, perhaps in content and in subject matter but at the same time you're not losing sight of the fact that you are in the 20th century and the 20th century uh, has its demands on you in terms of techniques in terms of uh, styles so the the content can be um, I mean historic can can go back uh, as far as the perhaps before the 17th century when their um, yeah I mean when the Irish culture was up and, and kicking as they say uh, this is in terms of content and again they would uh, experiment with the styles and experimenting with the style and with the language is obviously a 20th century characteristic or, or, or feature <coughs> Uh, again, uh, the plays of the time and the works of the time would also reflect the tensions uh, and the conflicts within the Irish society itself. Remember, we spoke about the idea that when the British came, they managed 
to split the country into two camps you have the unionists unionists those who believe that uh, Britain should stay and those who believe that they should uh, become united with Britain uh, as part of Britain and that's why we're calling them uh, unionists and those nationalists who believe that no uh, the British are invaders and typical of any uh, invaders they have to at one point leave they have to leave and we should have our own independence okay so those tensions started to kind of pop up and they they uh, of course um, they they wanted people or uh, uh, perhaps military talents to express them and they did they did express those tensions in their work or in their works okay so um, there was in, in in the works of the time a reflection of the social disruption caused by the political violence and the questions of political and cultural identity provoked by the physical confrontations on even on the streets there were confrontations between you know the unionists uh, and uh, nationalists. The unionists are for the most part protestant because they um, have their allegiance to uh, uh, Britain and the nationalists are for the most part Catholic. So adding to the uh, political persuasions that we're having, we're also having uh, you know sectarian orthodoxies whether we're talking about the uh, protestants or the, the Catholic, they started to fight each other and a great deal of blood would be spilled. Uh, okay, so let's um, talk briefly about the play and uh, typical of plays, it is divided into acts. Um, so Act 1 is set on a warm day in early August um, in 1936 in the home of the Mondi family, two miles outside the village of Ballybig County, Dongle, Ireland. So Ballybig is, is fictional, but of course there is a county by the name of Dongle, and of course there is a country by the name of Ireland, right? And the play opens uh, with a monologue by Michael and he's going to talk about his memory of the summer of that year when he was seven. So the family have just acquired a new age and um, to talk about trade you in the early uh, 20th century of course was a big deal um, the video uh, uh, re the radio was more or less like having the internet nowadays okay and what is what would be the significance of the radio if you compare it to the internet and what the internet did with the internet yeah I mean the whole world has become uh, like a small village or a small uh, perhaps l little than uh, less than a village it, it became a district right um, which means that you don't really have any thing that can prevent you from having access to the out outside world and the outside world will also have access to you uh, what kind of access would that be? It would be the exchange of ideas, okay? So you get ideas from the outside world and the outside world would export uh, its ideas to you. So this is uh, the link. I mean, now they have the radio and they are obviously celebrating this occasion. Remember, uh, yeah, and it's very s strange. Uh, the things that we're now taking for granted uh, were a uh, uh, were big deal for, for people, of course, in the early 20th century. Again, 
the radio would be very symbolic and it would be very symbolic of the new ideas that will uh, come to this small area of the world so secluded so um, distant uh, and so um, separated from the rest of the world okay when we have people who refrain to themselves who are um, you know um, they think that they they are protecting themselves from from the outside world uh, they are so set in their old ways they think in a very traditional way they resort to their traditions as a source of perhaps uh, security um, again you would uh, kind of expect what kind of ideas they would circulate among themselves you would kind of expect what kind of behavior they have Conserv conservative uh, very traditional very religious very everything extreme right again uh, for ideas to come from the outside world to them would be uh, something that they wouldn't welcome right they would um, consider this kind of invading their privacy uh, violating their norms uh, and they would resist of course so the play opens with a monologue by Michael um, and Michael happens to be the narrator or the narrator which is very strange to have a play that has uh, a narrator and he was a child at the time he he was the son of one of the five um, you know ladies that we, that the play uh, um, is about and he would be playing around looking at what other people are doing and then much later when he grows up he's going to narrate what happens from perhaps the per perspective of a grown up so again the first thing that would strike our eyes would be the idea that the family has acquired a new radio not a new radio it's a radio because there was no old radio that they are replacing it's uh, the radio was an invention and uh, um, they have acquired it like everybody else and this is the first assault uh, on their traditions on their lack of openness from the outside world again the radio is very significant because it's um, it's going to bring uh, you know ideas it's going to to, to bring uh, thoughts and philosophies so they they are no longer uh, you know the close society that they would want uh, uh, themselves to be no there is no way of going back if you have uh, the radio the radio is going to the, you cannot control what ideas the radio will uh, bring um, to you again that would create tension that would create conflict between those who believe that um, uh, ideas from the outside world are fine and will have to uh, embrace them and those who believe that no we shouldn't be open to to new ideas we should honor our history we should honor our traditions um, uh, yeah, this is typical this is this kind of clash is always and everywhere it's in ireland at the time it, it is uh, in the Arab world, it's in in in, in Europe, uh, it's almost everywhere, and uh, down through the ages. Um, again, um, it's the radio, and it's all also um, Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack is one of those characters. Uh, we have like four or five ladies and they have 
their brother their, their their elder brother is a priest and he he was on a religious mission in Uganda in Africa for almost 20 years so again when he comes back you expect him to also come up with new ideas but where where is he going to get those ideas he was in Africa and at the time Africa Africa of the time is and uh, we're talking about the early 20th century where also Africa was all about supernatural uh, stuff was about backwardness so it's it's not really new ideas that is going to to bring the, perhaps he would bring disease per, perhaps he would bring uh, misery when when he comes back at uh, uh, at 60 when he's 60 or 60 something and he has his um, you know uh, cognitive powers in decline he he hardly remembers people he hardly remembers situations so it was kind of you know sad um, so he's not bringing something um, any happy something that um, they were look looking forward to having um, their brother you know I mean they remember the 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 image of him when he left um, 20 years earlier um, so the action of the play opens as the five sisters do chores while breaking into singing and dancing inspired by the new raid you see there is a celebration of a sort marking the um, the coming of the radio so dancing and singing uh, and uh, perhaps to the accompaniment of the radio because out of the radio you would have dancing and you have singing and stuff um, what is significant here would be the idea that the radio was not um, you know avoided by everyone it's only those um, conservative uh, sides or elements in in the family and in society who would who would oppose the, the the existence of the radio because they are so fearful of um, uh, of the fact that the radio may change their their lifestyle they would challenge their existence as conservative and this is like I said is everywhere um one of the those uh, five uh, female ladies is called agnes and she she suggests that they all attend the upcoming local harvest dance to which maggie rose and chris respond respond enthusiastically okay so we have a local harvest dance i, I would like you to kind of set the idea of the of the radio against this local harvest dance local harvest dance means that we're talking about traditions we're talking about the past okay while the radio uh, is about the future is about new ideas so there is a clash of a sort between uh, new ideas as uh, pro done by the radio and old ideas as uh, given um, when they talk about uh, this local harvest dance that they uh, th that they want to attend <coughs> so act one ends with uncle jack's reenacting a ritual dance from uganda again what is uncle jack's contribution to what is happening his contribution is more or less supernatural um, he was a Christian missionary and his role was to convert the natives in Uganda um, to Christianity uh, obviously he stayed there uh, long or way long that even he himself got uh, used to their habits and he started to kind of practice the rituals which is of course pagan which is again very strange Um, in Act 2, uh, the act takes place in early September, three weeks later. 
the women are doing chores the little boy is making kind of the little boy is the narrator by the way <coughs> uh, after one of his annual walks of the day uncle jack describes a ritual ceremony in uganda that he participated in um, which included the sacrifice of animals again it's not animals that they used to sacrifice over there they would even sacrifice people they were more or less uh, having cannibalistic attitudes again you would think of what uncle jack brought when he came back okay it's uh, this um, sense of paganism uh, uh, paganistic rituals again the different female characters the five ladies have different inclinations and different persuasions uh, one of them would um, be working as a teacher and the other would be helping around the house which is typical uh, a third one would at one point elope with uh, a guy and then she she has a child from him and stuff like that one of them would be out of touch of uh, with reality she would uh, um, kind of uh, be easily taken in and deceived by uh, um, <coughs> one of the uh, uh, those um, young people uh, I mean a womanizer of a sort who would come every now and then and uh, he would say the self same thing and she relents and then he leaves her and travels and then comes back with promises and uh, stuff like that and then we have at one point we would have Michael the narrator and he would provide uh, a long monologue that explains the fate of all the characters so we see them so uh, we have two big moments in, in this play we have the moment where uh, uh, this was perhaps uh, um, 1936 when they are all gathered everybody is around and uh, um, they they are given the opportunity to talk and you get to know about them and even a bit uh, about their history and and this is all given from the perspective and the mind of the child Michael um, and then we have another moment uh, this the other moment has to do with Michael uh, growing up and he is now an adult narrator and he tells us about the fates what happened to um, the family members after uh, those long years so the adult uh, Michael then provides a long monologue that explains um, the fate of all characters Agnes and Rose uh, leave the family and never return uh, Uncle Jack dies of a heart attack and the scene returns to the kitchen in September 1936 where women are doing chores the kites with the primitive faces on them are presented to the audience uh, again the adult Michael ends with a monologue in which he states that much of the spirit and fun had gone out of their lives and when my time came to go away in the selfish way of young men I was happy to escape okay so as you can see he uh, the narrator cherishes those very uh, beautiful moments those happy old days when he was around his aunts and his uncle Jack and they were um, each uh, giving um, their perspective on life whether in act or in words this th these were happy uh, moments uh, he admits and acknowledges but he says at one point I myself uh, grew up and I decided to leave them behind 
and fly away for uh, better opportunities and uh, he doesn't believe this is the right thing to do and this is a typical um, Irish concern as you can see from the short stories uh, from what, what we said about the Irish culture they have this tendency to migrate to fly away from the here and the now okay remember when I spoke about this idea of brain drain that happens with lots of cultures and lots of people and lots of countries where the young people the talented among the population would leave the country behind and travel to other countries right uh, it happens here and it seems to be a recurrent theme the idea that at one point I mean Irish uh, Ireland would raise people up would protect them and take care of them to the best of its ability uh, in terms of perhaps money in terms of food and shelter and when they grew up they uh, wouldn't stay in order perhaps to to see the country uh, progress to to contribute to the building of the country they just decide to uh, travel away leaving uh, the country in its misery in its misfortune and in its poverty behind um, and sometimes um, they feel regretful and remorseful over that look at um, for example Joyce uh, Joyce obviously didn't write Dublin, the Dubliners in, in Dublin when he was in Dublin he wrote about Dublin when he was away and it seems that Joyce had this uh, feeling feelings of regret um, that he left Dublin behind and he couldn't help and, and writing about Dublin the way he did was uh, perhaps um, a contribution on his part he says or he didn't say that I mean you, you you almost feel it that he is trying to kind of uh, make amends he, he he thinks that he did something wrong and he's trying to make up uh, uh, for it by writing about Dublin by uh, perhaps uh, uh, talking about how he sees Dublin and its else and evils and perhaps people would pick up those uh, um, points and would somehow uh, work on resolving the issues and the tensions and we can have a different Dublin again it seems that we're having the same echoes here it seems that uh, Michael the narrator when he uh, grows up he would uh, kind of think of the past and for him the past was very nice and very interesting and very warm and he would say that these were the happy old days that I decided to uh, kind of renounce and leave behind and go somewhere else so you have this tinge of um, or this touch of regret uh, upon the, the part of the characters or some characters in the different plays and in different works and also upon the part of their creators the authors themselves Michael tells the significance of music and dance to his nostalgic memories of the summer of 1936 again if we talk about music and if we talk about dance we're talking about the whole uh, the old happy and the happy old days and even prior remember that music and dance is is part of the culture of Ireland it's, it seems that he he is also clinging back uh, to the past again he is modern and he perhaps lives on the continent where there is mo modernity and where there is no room for dance and stuff so again it seems that Freel is trying to strike a balance or to make compromises typical of his character and his nature he's trying to say that you you can be on the continent you can be uh, perhaps embracing 
a modernity but you still need dance and you still need that uh, i mean singing you still need your own culture and your own history so if we can bring them together th that would be a fine and a good thing so again you're having a modern individual this is the uh, michael the narrator w when when he is um, now uh, perhaps uh, an adult so this is the modern element in it and he is reflecting on the happy old days when there was dance when there was a uh, celebration of uh, harvesting and this is past so it's a reconciliation that uh, frill is um, or seems to be um, advocating again these are the characters so you have uncle jack uh, Agnes Mondi, Chris Mondi, Kate Mondi, Maggie Mondi, Rose Mondi, Michael Mondi as the narrator and the child Michael. Okay, it's a family that you you see. Uh, you have five ladies, and they are, they are all um, uh, they are not young. I mean, we're talking about people in their perhaps uh, late twenties and their thirties and forties or something. And you have a child, and ch the child happens to be the son of one of them. And you have Uncle Jack, uh, their uh, brother, their old brother, who has left the entire family for 20 years on, on a Christian mission in Africa. Uh, as you can see, the play is about the past, and it is also about the future. The play, the play is also about memory. The play is also about migration. When you talk about migration, you talk about Uncle Jack, and you also talk about Jerry. Jerry happens to be the perhaps the boyfriend of one of these ladies and the father uh, of Michael. So Jack is 53, and he is the brother of the five women. He spent 25 years as a missionary priest in Uganda, and he has recently re returned to Ireland, okay, sick with malaria. So this is the only thing that he brought from there. So he's sick with malaria. He has also cognitive decline. He doesn't remember things. He cannot keep the names of his, even the names of his sisters, uh, he doesn't remember. So he cannot keep the names uh, names of his sisters straight and has difficulty in remembering English words. Uh, perhaps remembering English words, ha if I'm not reading much into it, um, it's English that we're saying, right? So it's, uh, it may have to do with England as an occupier. You try to get rid of the idiom. Yeah, perhaps uh, this is extreme interpretation. So the character of Uncle Jack highlights Freel's theme of paganism. There is paganism that would tie the play to irrationality, which is, um, um, and also to the past, whether this past is African past or Irish past. Again, whether this is good or bad, this is, this is not clear. Again, what we know, for a fact is that Jack Mondi or uh, Uncle Mondi or Uncle Jack is not an inspiration. He doesn't uh, bring freshness to the play. He is more of a liability than an asset to the family when he came back. Okay, so you wouldn't say that perhaps uh, Freel is presenting him in, in order to uh, kind of gl gl glorify the past because Ireland in the past was not Christian. We're talking about the Ireland uh, um, of the pre-Christian era when it was pagan. They used to believe in many gods and stuff. I 
and when and then we have Agnes Mondi she 35 and is the middle of the five sisters she nets to support them again the idea of netting the idea of having uh, female elements working in order to support the family um, again we have a problem with Agnes the fact that um, she was netting along with uh, with her uh, other uh, sister Rose and they working they were working uh, perhaps from home um, and people used to buy stuff from them um, when the play opens we have this prospect that uh, a knitting factory is opening in town and if you have a knitting factory it means that they will come out of business because lots uh, I mean if it's a factory it means that it uh, produces things in its mass production that we're having and with mass production you have uh, perhaps lower prices so people would uh, kind of um, um, buy stuff from the factory and they would leave uh, uh, the two sisters behind nobody would show interest in in what they are knitting obviously again this is also uh, perhaps uh, a reference to the modern world and what the modern world is bringing so it's bringing ruin uh, it's it it's uh, it, it kinds it kind of you know uh, get people out of work um, so uh, the modern world is 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 not all about prosperity and well-being and uh, big promises and great expectations as uh, lots of people assume it can also have uh, a bad effect on local economies like we're having here Uh, so Agnes together with Rose leave the family home never to return again this is the idea of migration okay but again you would ask why would they migrate uh, for for obvious reasons they used to net they used to have work and now uh, a knitting factory is uh, in town and they they have no access to uh, they have no access to money and to uh, um, other essentials but they would uh, leave and uh, leave and migrate uh, to uh, for uh, other places and better opportunities again the focus again is on the idea of poverty on the idea of people not having enough to eat and survive on so the only uh, open door for them would be migration Michael locates her in London where she has died after 25 years yeah she went to London where uh, there were uh, perhaps better opportunities again this this is at the core of the idea of migration and the theme of migration that we have in uh, in the play and then we have Chris Mondi she's um, 26 and she's the youngest of the five sisters and she is the mother of the narrator Michael um, again she was in love with a guy by the name of Jerry uh, Evans and Jerry Evans was a womanizer uh, and they uh, would have a son out of wedlock and this son is, uh, is Michael um, Chris would bring to the play this element of um, the outside world he comes back from outside from outside of I mean he obviously uh, he's on the move for whatever reason he goes and then he comes back and he meets with Chris and he yeah, kind of uh, talks to her and he gives her empty promises about what kind of life awaiting for them and then he leaves behind he leaves uh, uh, for a while and then comes back um, uh, I'm stressing the fact that Chris along with Jack 
along with Michael when he grows up bring the idea of approach if you like the, they are uh, the approved elements in in this play they bring ideas whether these ideas are new or old <coughs> and they assault the uh, the seemingly stable life of this family uh, each in in his own way for example um, Mm, uh, when we talk about Jerry, like I said, he is this uh, play boy who comes back and, and assaults and challenges their religious sensitivities uh, by perhaps having a relationship out of wedlock with their sister and they get a child out of this uh, kind of thing. Uh, when you talk about Jack, wh wh what does Uncle Jack bring? nothing it's only paganism and it's only african rituals it's it's only malaria malaria and uh, it's only in um, uh, impotence the fact that he is also uh, in uh, dec decline uh, cognitively he doesn't remember things so he is like i said is more of a liability than an asset and then you also have Michael, Michael, uh, we see Michael when he uh, grew up and he is narrating and he is uh, perhaps he is the only honest individual in the play. He says that we we are in in in, um, in Ireland. We live there. We get raised by the people of Ireland, but when we grow up and we feel that life is not changing that we uh, cannot um uh, i mean um we, we we cannot achieve what we wha what we have in mind we leave ireland behind and we don't and we're not ready to make any sacrifices like or offer any sacrifices uh, as our um, you know as the old generation did so uh, Chris is repeatedly taken in by Jerry's unreliable promises and Jerry jokes with her, makes her laugh and frequently breaks into a dance with her. This is what he is fit for. And then after a while he leaves her behind and goes away. You also have Kate Mondi. She's the oldest of the five sisters. Uh, she's 40 years old and was once a school teacher. Um, she um, is presented as the most resistant to the changes taking place around her and especially critical of the pagan singing and dancing. Okay. So you may sense um, this uh, contradiction that we have felt when Gabriel and, and the character of Kate okay she is um, a teacher she's um, again uh, she likes the atmosphere she teaches students uh, perhaps about their culture and everything but she she doesn't like the idea of dancing and the idea of you know uh, going out to the festival um, and I'll tell you why remember she is Catholic and she considers these practices as pagan that would according to her that would tie Ireland to uh, this era before um, the advent of Christianity if she is uh, more or less um, one of those people who are uh, are not open to to the world uh, she's not tolerant to, to say the least okay um, again she she wouldn't welcome and appreciate what Jack uh, or Uncle Jack is doing when he kinds of reenacts um, a ritual or a dance that he had when he was in Uganda a pagan one uh, and she wouldn't welcome also the idea that her sisters go out 
and mark the harvest by dancing because she believes that dancing and harvesting are par uh, things that uh, kind of link Ireland to the past to uh, the time before the coming of Christianity and this is pagan and this is not obeying God in any way okay she's uh, very uh, religious Maggie is uh, 38 and she's the second oldest of the five sisters and works as the cook and housekeeper of their home. Th th you have this image is uh, is um, or this character is always there. We have seen it in the dead in the character. I don't remember if you can remind me of this character who has to sacrifice her uh, pleasures. She has to sacrifice herself uh, for uh, the rest of the family. She has to work around the house. Yeah, Lily, excellent, your comer. Lily in the dead. Yes. <coughs> Um, she is also, you know, the joker of the family. A joker here does not mean that she, um, she um, uh, it's not a, 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 be, a, a belittling uh, label or term. He doesn't. Joker means that she brings happiness and joy. And perhaps she would interfere whenever uh, um, there is tension. She tries to kind of... Um, um, you know, appease everybody. She tries to help each, uh, every and each one of them. She has this soothing effect on on everyone. And then Rose Mondi, who is thirty-two and the second youngest sister. She works. Um, uh, she nets to support the family and she is in love with Danny Bradley who is a married man with three children this is another assault and another criticism uh, on one of the pillars of the Irish society the um, the religious or the institution of religion you know as Catholics as Catholics Irish uh, people are not supposed to divorce. This is typical of Catholicism. You may have divorce in Protestantism, but when it comes to Catholicism, no. Okay. So that's why you will have those examples of unhappy, um, unhappily married people, um, you know, uh, having affairs with people from outside their circle which means you may have an unhappy lady uh, she cannot get the divorce. divorce she, she, she goes out and perhaps has an affair with uh, somebody other than her husband and you may have an unhappy husband uh, who cannot get a divorce so he may go and have um, some kind of affair with a lady other than his wife so it seems that Frill is maybe criticizing this institution the religion institution that insists that uh, um, you get married once and there is no way you can uh, either either of the two partners can ask for divorce and the case of Miss Sinko like Kamar is saying right in uh, in a painful case for example uh, you have Sinko who, who is who, who cannot ask for divorce from her husband her husband was a, a ship cap a, a ship captain and he's always on the move okay so what is it uh, that she can do she cannot ask for divorce um, the next thing you know is that she's having um, a relationship that we would consider illicit with um, a stranger, with somebody uh, from outside. Oh, again, so this may be a criticism that uh, 
uh, prime frill is leveling against the institution of religion and then we have Jerry Evans who is 33 and he is the father of the illegitimate son Michael Jerry appears every year or so and Chris is charmed by him all over again Chris is one of the ladies Jerry is unreliable and has a new idea for a career path with each visit a typical of people I mean he is more or less like uh, a deceptive guy and she is very uh, credulous she is very gullible gullible means that she is easily deceived by the sweet talks of others I mean he comes it takes him like a, a, a two minutes to convince her that he is faithful that he likes her and it's only that uh, he has uh, business outside and that's why he left her for so long and came back so she's she uh, Jerry is a representation of the new world of ideas from the new world from outside which are not all good so um, the, the fact that uh, you have ideas from the outside world does not mean that all of them are good you have to filter them uh, which is something that Chris cannot do Chris is easily taken by any story by uh, Jerry and Chris is a representation of uh, women in Ireland at the time because of uh, perhaps um, uh, the lack of access to uh, quality education she is uh, credulous she doesn't know about the ways of the world she should, so she's easily deceived by this guy so he is a representation and she is also a representation Again, this is the child, Michael Mondi, whom we see now as um, an adult uh, narrator. So Michael, as a young man, function as, uh, or functions as a narrator and describes the action of the play through direct monologue. He engages in direct monologue. It's like more or less like a soliloquy to the audience, right? Remember soliloquies from... Uh, uh, Othello and uh, the Duchess of Malfi the child Michael in the flashbacks is making and painting a series of kites only toward the end of the play are his paintings displayed to the uh, and there is a sig significance to the choice of uh, the game that this uh, child is playing it's kites what do kites represent? What are kites a symbol of? I'm asking you. Excellent. Freedom. Flying away from the here and the now. You see my hand? This is how a, this is how a kite moves. It. You know? You know, it reminds, also, it reminds me of... Remember this uh, poem by William Wordsworth? I wondered... Remember, I wandered lonely as a cloud. This is a cloud. You see? Cloud means freedom. Right? Okay. So only towards, only towards the end of the play are his paintings displayed to the audience. Uh, perhaps there is there there have to be a reason why or there has to be a reason why it is only displayed at the end because at the end everybody has you have the five different kites or even six kites and they all lift right uh, you have Jack uh, Mondi he died right and the other five I mean there is no mention of them and lots of them I mean some of them left and uh, the narrator 
cannot track them down right so this is the kite uh, i mean at one point you can even uh, lose control of the kite and it just goes away and you don't know where uh, it is headed right you don't even ask Uh, and what are the themes that we have uh, that we're dealing with we have the theme of memory yes so you have memory uh, change you have paganism music you have dancing ritual and history and you would add to them the theme of migration migration is very important okay and migration for uh, perhaps political reasons for economic reasons right okay so these are are the ideas that we are going to or we are already addressing ourselves to okay so the main focus is um, is on on the play as a text so the and the main themes like we said are migration and memory and the concluding section of of this part focuses on the language and on performance um, again you would think of the play as located in and within uh, irish literary tradition um, in terms of the atmosphere in terms of the choice of setting in terms of e even the characters and how they behave you would also think of the play as having um you know at as having interpret uh, yeah, inspiration from um you know from the continent whether we're talking about irish literature or um literature from the United States the play is set in Ireland's County Dongle in uh, August 1936 uh, in a fictional town by the name of Bally Big you know spoken enough about the history of Ireland I'm not going to revisit this part again Again, it's very strange that the play, when it was popular, when it was uh, first performed, it was performed in the Abbey Theatre. It wasn't performed in a theatre that uh, Freel has and owns by the name of the Field Day Theatre. This is very significant because uh, uh, it perhaps uh, talks about, um, you know, national and nationalist ideas when we talk about the uh, those con uh, ideas that concern everybody when you talk about theater uh, uh, when we talk about migration and the, the reasons why people migrate uh, when we talk um, about uh, the history of Ireland um, and those um, elements of history that we see in the play whether we're talking about dance whether we talk about uh, paganism and then we have new ideas and then you have the contentions and the conflicts and the clashes between the old ideas and the new ones these are ideas that he, he couldn't have expressed in uh, the field day theater and it, it's only very natural that he chooses the happy theater uh, to kind of perform the play and promote these ideas because of uh, the the nationalist um, you know a tinge to it the fact that the happy theater is all about nationalism is all about nationalist and, and Irish concerns again you would also like to read the play against 
the background of violence that was uh, taking place and the violence um, has been the lot of Ireland for uh, much of the 20th century and that time would be re re referred to as the troubles and where you have tensions between Catholics and Protestants or Anglicans you would uh, have uh, tensions between nationalists and unionists and a great deal of blood will be shed will be spilled or split spilled yes again uh, um, Freel seems to be uh, in this agreement he doesn't believe that violence and clashes and conflicts would solve any issues so plays like these are meant to um, to serve as a third way where we can entertain writers from per perhaps um, you know, both both sides and they can talk about the issues and they can give uh, hope to people they can uh, try to convince people that violence um, doesn't pay it doesn't uh, it, it, it sometimes even complicate things Um, again, uh, with his uh, theater, there was a great deal of ideology. There is a, um, a great, there was a great deal of political motivations, and there, um, there was, um, there was a great deal that he doesn't like. Perhaps that would be uh, again one reason why he shifted away from the field day uh, theater to uh, the Abbey Theatre. Okay. Um, so the, the first issue that uh, we want to address would be the idea of memory. And um, so memory of what? And who would bring about this kind of memory? So who are responsible for memory in the play? Uh, first and foremost, you would have Michael, the narrator, who, yes, absolutely, like Nabila is saying, you would have Michael when he was a child, only a child, with his mother who happens to one member of this family and he would look at them and see how they behave and and uh, make observations and he would keep those observations until he becomes old and mature and he would express them uh, in his narrative right so you would have Michael and you would like Kamar is saying you would have uh, uh, at a lesser degree you would have Jack uh, who would uh, bring about memories uh, from when he was in Africa okay uh, it is true that those memories are not uh, you know they wouldn't add fuel to what is happening obviously the, these were memories of uh, big and rituals uh, and he would uh, when bringing those memories he would uh, perhaps add to this side uh, remember we said that if we have two parties in uh, or two conflicting parties in this uh, play we would have people who believe in Ireland the Irish uh, past even before it became Christian and in this case you would they, they would celebrate 
uh, dance they would celebrate harvesting and they would also uh, celebrate uh, you know big in elements obviously I mean dancing uh, during harvest was a big an el element that Kate uh, didn't um, entertain and admire because Kate belongs to Christian she's Christian and she is d a devout Christian so you have Jack uh, talking about uh, big and rituals and reenacting some of them when he came back to Ireland would be uh, adding to the picture of of that side of the conversation or the, or the argument uh, that says Ireland should go back to the past to even uh, it's it's past before the ad advent of Christianity <coughs> So various ways in which memory works as a theme or through characters. Uh, first of all, you're not having uh, Michael present on the stage. And in his narrative monologues, Michael makes an explicit theme of memory. Yes, it's all about retelling. It's, it's, it's all flashbacks that he is engaged in. Uh, characters in the play make sense of their 1936 uh, in Bally Big and their relations to each other by recalling their pasts, each in his own way of force. Jack, Jack's memories of his life in Kiang village in Uganda are a separate matter from those memories in Ireland. Again, Jack recalls their mother and Chris as a baby and the memory comes to him like a picture, a camera picture and a photograph and in spite of his this um, cognitive decline that he is um, having he still has whenever it's a sweet memory he he reproduces it um, uh, in an accurate way um, so that would bring us to the idea of memory and with whether memory opposes history or they work in harmony or what or history is better than memory this has always been the contention not not in this play only but in, in other works of art where uh, the the role of memory is um, is big so people would engage on um, talk about memory, whether uh, memory is part of history uh, and the difference between memory and history and stuff like that. So there is a specific period and place that Michael recalls. He, call, he recalls uh, um, 1936 and it's the village of Ballybick. This is the historical perspective However, this is loosely presented again because you're not presenting history. With history, you have chronology. You have things happening first and then second and then the third as they happen. Okay, there is respect for, you know, sequence. What, okay, what happens first and then second. And with memory, memory is selective, right? Uh, memory sometimes um, you don't remember everything because sometimes you don't want to remember bad stuff your memory is sometimes porous like they say it things can escape your memory if you like does it make it any less than history absolutely not right it is in relatively small everyday de details that the place, sense of period and location is created. Details that hold in a general way with any awareness of Ireland's social history that an audience may have. Um, again, the stress here is on if you're reading history, go, go. If you want history, you go and read history books. Okay? 
But if you if you want a work of art where memory plays a substantial part, go. And if there are gaps, you can always go back to uh, the history books and fill uh, those gaps. In other words, the writer or the author or the literary uh, writer is not and should not uh, present history. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, he would turn into a historian, right? But there has to be uh, um, a distinction between history and literature. Okay. Again, memory is selective. And whatever uh, escapes the memory uh, of perhaps the writer, it, it doesn't escape him. He, he focuses on on whatever he thinks is relevant to the argument that he is building in a play, right? If something drops or falls, you can always go back to history. Again, uh, a writer in using memory would also depend on the memory of the uh, of the audience if something slips by mistake or unintentionally something is not mentioned um, the audience uh, historically conscious uh, and con con historically aware as they are they can always um, connect the dots and fill and close the gaps right So the question remains, is memory more important than history in the play or in any work of art for this matter? So dancing at Lunaza is structured around memory and attends to the workings of memory more emphatically than it dwells on historical events and narrative. Uh, it is very clear and uh, um, uh, and obviously uh, um, f um, Brian Friel is not saying otherwise he's saying this is a work of art this is not a history book um, memory is normally fluid and more individual which is uh, you know consistent with works of art with characters in a work of art while history is organized and evidence-based evidence-based and consensual right so in in plays and in in, in in literary works you present characters who are uh, sometimes fragile who are who are you know um, individuals when you talk about individuals I mean they can remember and they can forget uh, this is typical human beings and if you present them any otherwise i mean the members of the audience would accuse you of being uh, unrealistic so we're presenting human beings uh, with their own memories uh, whether they remember much or little this is their character right uh, Characters are not historians in literary works, so you don't treat with them, or you 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 wouldn't treat them the way you treat a historian. You talk about historical accuracy, you talk about objectivity, right? These things that you normally accord uh, uh, with history. No, this is not a history book, mind you. So again, history is organized evidence-based and relatively consensual um, <clears throat> sometimes uh, history is even considered as an aspect of memory but what kind of memory it is collective memory and that is uh, that a reasonable understanding of the past or present should be aware of both the individual and the collective dimensions of memory. 
so history is collective memory and memory in place is individual memory okay memory is fluid uh, you don't have um, you know beginning middle and an end to it it's not as organized as history okay memory is not a conscious act while history is okay Uh, in uh, Friel's field day plays, the, the focus was on history. But this time around in the Lunasa, the, the focus is on memory, selective memory, individual memory. So in Dancing at Lunasa, uh, um, the emphasis is more on memory and less on history. Again, you would also bring in another element, which is the idea of autobiography. So how autobiographical the play is. So we're talking about collective memory, uh, we're talking about history, and we're talking also about a measure of autobiography to what is happening. Uh, again, you would think of the character of the narrator, Michael, as perhaps a representation of uh, Freel. Um, according to Helen Logic, uh, the play is neither autobiography or nor documentary, but a drama that explores complex issues in the lives of invented characters. Um, I, I think uh, I think we'll um, stop in this note and with this item unless you have um, questions. So do you have any questions so far? So far so good. So how do you find the experience with this play? Do you think it's engaging enough? Um, and I think you haven't read it yet. Still have time to read it. So if you have any questions, we can answer them. If you have any insights that you would like to share, that's okay too. So if you don't have any, we're going to call it a night or a day. Inshallah, you can you can do. The, I mean, it's easier, Sarah. You can you can finish it and easily and quickly. Yeah, it is, it is. Uh, um, Kamar is saying that uh, she's actually reading it. And uh, the fact that it was, I was uh, um, scared at first because plays can be challenging, but this was pretty easy and fun. That's, that's interesting to know, yeah, Kamar. Um, it's okay. We still have time. We, we still have an entire week before the final exams. The, the final exams are not next week or the week after, right? You guys have the schedule by now, right? Uh, okay. 
Um, I don't know. I don't know yet. Uh, perhaps on on uh, when we meet on Monday, we can talk about it. But at, as it stands, I would like you to study everything. Uh, judging from previous um, semesters, then we normally have everything. Okay. So study everything. And uh, I wish you all uh, good luck. And until we meet again on Monday, it's. Uh, um, I wish you all the best. Allah, salam alaikum, everyone. Bye bye.